In 1942, Nazi Germany controlled much of the European continent. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic, 130,000 people, including scientists, engineers, and construction workers, with a $2 billion budget, were engaged in a secret project that would forever change the world. Most of these workers were unaware of the project's ultimate goal due to the high level of secrecy. This initiative would become known as the Manhattan Project, a program focused on the research and development of the first nuclear weapons. From 1942 to 1946, the project was led by Major General Leslie Groves of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, while nuclear physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer was the director of the Los Alamos laboratory that designed the bombs. Groves and Oppenheimer decided that for security reasons, they needed to establish a centralized, secret research laboratory in a remote location. This would become known as Project Y. Oppenheimer favored a location in New Mexico at a site he knew well. A flat mesa near Santa Fe, New Mexico, which was the site of a private boys' school. The Los Alamos Laboratory was built on the site of the school, taking over some of its buildings. At the Los Alamos Laboratory, Oppenheimer gathered the best physicists of the time, calling them the luminaries. Initially, the team at Los Alamos focused on creating a plutonium-based gun-type fission weapon nicknamed Thin Man. However, by April 1944, they realized that this type of plutonium had a high rate of spontaneous fission due to plutonium-240, which could trigger a premature detonation. Oppenheimer then reorganized the laboratory and orchestrated a successful effort on an alternative design proposed by John von Neumann, an implosion-type nuclear weapon, which was called Fat Man, and a gun-type design using uranium-235, which became known as Little Boy. While the sense of accomplishment for Oppenheimer and his luminaries was significant in that their work paid off, they never knew who could be watching. Concerns about whether the complex Fat Man design would work led to a decision to conduct the first nuclear test. Prior to this test, there was also some concern among scientists that a nuclear explosion might initiate a reaction that could ignite the atmosphere. Based on the theoretical possibility that a nuclear explosion could generate temperatures high enough to cause a fusion reaction in nitrogen atoms in the atmosphere, leading to a catastrophic chain reaction. However, after detailed calculations and discussions, they concluded that such an outcome was extremely unlikely. So they went on with the test. The codename Trinity was assigned by Oppenheimer himself, who along with some 425 people were present on the weekend of the test. They were told to lie face down on the ground and wear black goggles to protect their eyes from the intense flash of the explosion. On July 16, 1945, at 5.29 a.m., the United States Army conducted the first ever detonation of a nuclear weapon. The test was of an implosion-designed plutonium bomb, nicknamed the Gadget. While watching the explosion, Oppenheimer remembered a line from the Bhagavad Gita, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. On the other side of the world, U.S. President Harry Truman was at the Potsdam Conference in the Soviet occupation zone of Germany when he received the news through a coded message from Secretary of War Henry Stimson informing him that the test had been successful, beyond expectations. This crucial information greatly influenced the discussions at the Potsdam Conference, especially in how Truman handled diplomatic negotiations with the Soviet Union about ending the war and shaping the post-war world. When Truman informed Stalin of the atomic bomb, he said that the United States had a new weapon of unusual destructive force. But Stalin had full knowledge of the atomic bomb's development from Soviet spy networks inside the Manhattan Project, and told Truman at the conference that he hoped Truman would make good use of it against the Japanese. On July 26, 1945, the United States, Britain and China issued the Potsdam Declaration outlining Japan's terms of surrender. 
The declaration came with a firm ultimatum. We will not deviate from them. There are no alternatives. We shall brook no delay. The declaration demanded the elimination of military influence in governance, limited Japanese sovereignty to the main islands, and called for complete disarmament, emphasizing democratic reforms and human rights. It also outlined terms for economic rehabilitation and the path towards a peace-oriented self-government under Allied occupation until these goals were met. The mention of unconditional surrender came at the end of the declaration. We call upon the government of Japan to proclaim now the unconditional surrender of all Japanese armed forces and to provide proper and adequate assurances of their good faith in such action. The alternative for Japan is prompt and utter destruction. American bombers dropped over three million leaflets describing the declaration over Japan. Even though picking up enemy propaganda leaflets and listening to foreign radio broadcasts was illegal in Japan. The terms of the declaration sparked intense debate within the Japanese government. After receiving the declaration, Foreign Minister Togo quickly convened a meeting with Prime Minister Suzuki and Cabinet Secretary Sakomizu. Sakomizu noted that there was a consensus on the need to accept the declaration. However, despite leaning towards acceptance, Togo found the terms vague regarding Japan's future government structure, disarmament processes, and the fate of accused war criminals. He also hoped that the Soviet Union might mediate negotiations with the Western allies to clarify and possibly revise the terms. However, as we will see, Togo's hope for Soviet mediation would ultimately backfire, dramatically. Shortly after, Togo met with Emperor Hirohito and advised him to consider the declaration very carefully, suggesting they delay a response until they heard from the Soviets about mediating peace. According to a foreign ministry official, Hirohito immediately expressed that he found the declaration acceptable in principle. Meanwhile, the Supreme Council for the Direction of the War met the same day to discuss the declaration. War Minister Anami, General Umezu, and Admiral Toyoda opposed accepting the declaration, argued that the terms were too dishonorable, and advised for the Japanese government to reject it openly. On the other hand, Suzuki, Togo, and Admiral Yonai were inclined to accept the declaration, but agreed that clarification was needed over the status of the emperor. Ultimately, the council accepted Togo's proposal to delay their response until they received a reply from the Soviets. Suzuki stated that the Japanese policy toward the declaration was one of mokusatsu, killing with silence, which the United States interpreted as meaning rejection by ignoring. This led to a decision by the White House to carry out the threat of destruction. In Operation Meeting House, Tokyo had already been extensively damaged by firebombing raids, which reduced its value as a target for demonstrating the power of the atomic bomb. Tokyo was also the seat of the emperor and the location of high-ranking military officers. Preserving these individuals was crucial for negotiations and to facilitate a surrender. Initially considered as a target, Kyoto was removed from the list due to its cultural importance and replaced by Nagasaki. The targets chosen for the atomic bombs were Hiroshima, Kokura, Niigata and Nagasaki. These cities were selected because they were large urban areas with significant military facilities. Hiroshima, in particular, was a major supply and logistics base for the Japanese military. It served as a vital communications center, a key port for shipping, and an assembly area for troops. The city also housed a substantial war industry, producing parts for planes, boats, as well as bombs. So naturally, residents wondered why Hiroshima had been spared from firebombing that ravaged other cities. Some speculated that Hiroshima was being preserved for future US occupation headquarters, while others wondered if their relatives in Hawaii and California had appealed to the US government to spare the city. But Hiroshima was spared for a completely different reason. On August 6, 1945, the B-29 bomber, Enola Gay, named after Colonel Paul Tibbetts' mother, and piloted by Tibbetts himself, took off from Northfield on Tinian, destined for Japan. 
Enola Gay was part of a trio that included two other B-29s, the Great Artiste, commanded by Major Charles Sweeney, which carried instrumentation, and a then nameless aircraft later named Necessary Evil was tasked with photography. After leaving Tinian, Enola Gay made its way separately to Iwo Jima to rendezvous with the Great Artiste and the Necessary Evil aircraft at 5.55 and set course for Japan. Parsons, who was in command of the mission, had witnessed four B-29s crash and burn at takeoff and feared that a nuclear explosion would occur if a B-29 crashed with an armed little boy on board. So he armed the bomb in flight to minimize the risks during takeoff. His assistant, 2nd Lieutenant Morris Jepson, removed the safety devices only 30 minutes before reaching the target area. Three other B-29s flew about an hour ahead, acting as weather scouts. Hanola Gay reached Hiroshima with clear skies at 8.09, local time, at which point Tibbets initiated the bomb run and handed control to his bombardier, Major Thomas Ferraby. At 8.15, Little Boy, which contained approximately 64 kilograms or 140 pounds of uranium-235, was released. It took 44.4 seconds to fall from the aircraft, flying at about 9.4 kilometers until it detonated approximately 580 meters above the city. At the moment of detonation, the temperature within the fireball itself reached to over 1 million degrees Celsius, matching temperatures found at the sun's core. This intense heat is generated by the nuclear fission reaction within the bomb. The fireball expanded rapidly, reaching a diameter of 280 meters or 306 yards within just one second. The heat rays emitted from the fireball raised ground temperatures near the hypercenter to about 4,000 degrees Celsius which is far beyond the melting point of many materials. This immense heat caused immediate devastating fires and contributed to the widespread destruction in the city. The radius of total destruction was about 1.6 kilometers, with fires spreading over 11 square kilometers. Affected by crosswinds, the bomb veered off its intended target, the Ioi Bridge, missing by about 240 meters and detonated directly above the Shima Surgical Clinic instead. It unleashed energy equivalent to 15 kilotons of TNT, or the simultaneous detonation of 33 million pounds of TNT. Enola Gay stayed over the target area for two minutes and was 16 kilometers or 10 miles away when the bomb detonated, and about 18.5 kilometers away before it felt the shock waves from the blast. Only Tibbets, Parsons and Ferriby were aware of the weapon's true nature. The rest of the crew were simply warned to expect a blinding flash and were provided with black goggles. It was hard to believe what we saw, Tibbets later told reporters. Parsons described the event as tremendous and awe-inspiring. The men aboard with me gasped, my God. People on the ground reported a pika, a brilliant flash of light, followed by a don a loud, booming sound. As survivors emerged from the ruins, they gradually realized that the entire city had been struck simultaneously. The Tokyo control operator of the Japan Broadcasting Corporation noticed that the Hiroshima station had gone off the air. He tried to re-establish the connection through another telephone line, but that also failed. About 20 minutes later, the Tokyo Railroad Telegraph Center realized that the main line telegraph had stopped working just north of Hiroshima. Unofficial reports of a massive explosion came from small railway stations within 16 kilometers or 10 miles of the city. All these reports were transmitted to the headquarters of the Imperial Japanese Army General Staff. Military bases repeatedly tried to contact the Army control station in Hiroshima, but were met with complete silence. The General Staff were puzzled by this as they knew that no large enemy raid had occurred and that no sizable store of explosives was in Hiroshima at that time. A young officer was instructed to fly immediately to Hiroshima to land, survey the damage and return to Tokyo with reliable information for the staff. It was felt that nothing serious had taken place and that the explosion was just a rumor. 
The officer went to the airport and flew southwest. After flying for about three hours, while still nearly 160 kilometers from Hiroshima, he and his pilot saw a great cloud of smoke from the firestorm created by the bomb. After circling the city to survey the extent of the destruction, they landed south of Hiroshima. Tokyo only learned that the city had been destroyed by a new type of bomb from President Truman's announcement of the strike, 16 hours later. After the Hiroshima bombing, Truman issued a statement announcing the use of the new weapon. He stated, We may be grateful to Providence that the German atomic bomb project had failed and that the United States and its allies had spent $2 billion on the greatest scientific gamble in history and won. Truman then warned Japan, If they do not now accept our terms, they may expect a reign of ruin from the air, the like of which has never been seen on this earth. The atomic bombing of Hiroshima resulted in approximately 126,000 deaths, of which 20,000 were soldiers and 106,000 were civilians. Admiral Toyoda, the chief of the Naval General Staff, speculated that no more than one or two additional bombs could be readied, so they decided to endure the remaining attacks, acknowledging there would be more destruction, but the war would go on. This communication was intercepted by American magic codebreakers. Since there was no indication of Japan surrendering, they decided to move forward with the plan to drop another atomic bomb.